Howdy, my name is Nonat, and did you know that the deadline for the RPG Superstar Contest is December 7th? Which means by the time this video is uploaded, you'll only have about a week left to get your monster done. Well, in the spirit of the contest, I am going to build a monster right here in front of you. And I'm going to put the monster into the contest to boot. Remember that you can enter up to three unique monsters, so my other one or two will be a secret, but this one you will be able to see created live here in front of you, and if it wins or not, I don't care, this is just for fun. I'm going to be creating it using the RPG Superstar Monster Creator Tool, which you can see at RPGSuperstar.com, as well as having the Game Mastery Guide open on screen as well, so you can see exactly what I'm looking at when I make certain decisions. I'm going to be going step by step through the Game Mastery Guide and building the creature using their guide, but there might be certain things here or there that I sort of take my own spin, we'll see. It is important, especially when entering a contest like RPG Superstar, that you stick to the original design philosophy of Pathfinder as closely as possible, as that is one of the prerequisites for the monsters. The closer your creature looks like an official creature, and that includes grammar, text orientation, capitalization, word organization, all of that goes into your entry. So, when creating a creature like this, it's important to cross-reference, check existing creatures, check existing wording, and put them in accordingly. But that's not to say you can't get very creative with it. So, without further ado, I am sipping on a advertiser-friendly beverage. So this should make this incredibly fun. Ooh, that's good. Advertiser-friendly beverage. So the first thing you want to do is develop a concept. This is an interesting thing to put first, because a lot of the time when I'm creating a creature, I'll think of what I want it to do first, and then develop the concept from there. Or if I'm in the middle of a very specific part of a campaign and I want to make a creature for a location, that's when I'll do the concept first. This is all going to be off the top of my head, this entire creature creation, so bear with me. As for a concept, I think a wild animal is a good place to start. Not a beast, not a magical creature, but just an animal. One of my biggest complaints with early game Pathfinder 2e, or also mainly late game, is that there's actually not a lot of animals out there. And sure, most of the creatures with the animal trait are existing animals from Earth and our world, but who's to say there aren't new types of animals? After all, the animal trait is strictly a creature with a low intelligence score of minus 4 or lower. After level 10 or 11, there's not that many animals left, which of course at that point, most things are magical in nature to keep up with the massive power curve. But hey, if a fighter or a barbarian doesn't have to be magical, who's to say a massive animal doesn't either? Specifically, my issue came when I looked at 9th level summon animal, which lets you summon a level 13 animal. And you have two options, a cave worm or a lizard. That's it. If you want to cast summon animal at ninth level, that's all you can summon. So I say let's make another level 13 animal for our level 17 spellcasters out there. There's our concept, so to speak. That is it. It's going to evolve a lot going forward, especially as we decide how to design it. But right now the concept is a 13th level option for summon animal. This actually gives us a really good base to work off of as we can examine both the Purple Worm and Caustic Monitor stat blocks to see about what we're looking at and make sure we don't do something totally redundant. For one thing, both of these existing 13th level animals are incredibly strength forward. They're not super dexterous, so I think making something more nimble could be a lot of fun. So we're going to go into our monster tool. We're going to select level 13. Uh, for size, both of the options are pretty big, so again, it could be interesting to have a smaller yet deadly option for an animal. So let's try to make a medium-sized animal. Just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's not less deadly. We're of course going to give it the animal trait and any other trait that might need to be added on later. Now what we can do to make our lives a lot easier here is to click this little button next to the name and pick a roadmap. 
These are pre-made sort of benchmarks for statistics. It's not going to decide on our stats for us, but it will give us recommendations based on which roadmap we choose to follow. If we're trying to make something nimble and quick that can rip you to shreds and vanish in the blink of an eye, we definitely want something dexterity based. So we could look at perhaps the skirmisher or maybe even make a dex based soldier. Alternatively, if we wanted to focus on something like stealth, we could even make it a dexterity-based skill paragon. I think our best bet here to make something fast and deadly will be the skirmisher. This is a creature who is designed to get in, get something done, get out, and keep the party on their toes. You know, it's not a brute. It's not going to sit there and soak up damage. It's going to keep people guessing and keep things happening. So we can already see, because we picked Skirmisher, it wants to give us a high dexterity, so plus 8 does sound pretty good for our dexterity score. Compare this to the Purple Worm and Caustic Monitors who have plus 7 to strength, that sounds great. I honestly want it to have a low constitution score though. This thing is going to be lithe and nimble, not tanky and durable. So while it is going to be incredibly deadly, it's going to have a lot lower hit points and lower uh, fortitude saves than something like a purple worm. As for intelligence, we know if it's an animal, it needs to have at least a minus four to intelligence. So that is absolutely what we're going to put in there. Now, wisdom gets a little more interesting. For example, we can see the Caustic Monitor Lizard has a plus four to wisdom, whereas the Purple Worm has a minus one. I think this really comes down to how they survive. Does this animal survive like the Purple Worm, simply destroying and consuming everything in its path without a second thought? Or is it actually a survivalist? Does this thing hide, prey on things at night while also remaining hidden? That sounds like exactly what we're going for, so it should have a decent wisdom. So I'm going to give it plus four to match up with that monitor lizard. And then similar to intelligence, animals aren't going to be one for a high charisma score. Maybe if it was something that tried to lure adventurers in, it could use a high charisma. Uh, this one, I'm going to give it a minus one. You know, it's not giant and hideous, but it's also not going to be winning beauty contests. And I skimmed over strength, but I think a plus five is going to be in the right territory. This thing is made to get in, down you, and jump out before anyone realizes what's happened. So a little bit of strength is going to be required to do that. Moderate sounds perfect. Now moving on to the defenses, we are going to have to play with these a little bit more, especially to line up with our stats that we changed, our ability modifiers. Starting off with armor class, we do know this thing is incredibly dexterous, which means it can duck, it can weave, and it can dodge out of the ways of attacks. It's also level 13, so this is gonna be up there. I think this thing will be relying on its high dexterity-based armor class to avoid getting hit, and then when it does get hit, it's a big deal. So I'm actually going to give this thing a high armor class of 34. You don't want to hit this thing, but you'll also have to remember, this thing is not very fortitude heavy. If you've got spell casters who are good at casting out fortitude saves, taking advantage of its measly plus 20 is going to be a lot easier than trying to hit its 34 armor class or its 26 reflex save. Especially reflex saves, you don't want to try to touch this thing. For once, we've found a problem that cannot be solved by Fireball. As for its will save, I, don't I do want to make it low, but it's not going to be as low as its fortitude. I'm going to reduce it to 22, because it's not stupid, but for me, the wisdom to survive does not equal its wisdom to resist. You know, this thing isn't mindless. It still does have a mind, and such can be influenced. So that will be another weakness of this creature. You know, creatures of lower intelligence are more susceptible to mental effects, as this should show. Now, as I was saying, if I want to give this thing a high armor class, I want it to be more brittle. So along with that low constitution score, along with that low fortitude save, I don't want it to have too many hit points. So I might go below the low offering. It says 172 to 180. I'm going to go with 160 hit points on this thing because not only is it going to be tough to hit with normal attacks, but the way that we're designing this creature, it's going to be going in and out and moving around and tough to keep track of. So that's going to add to the difficulty. When designing a monster, you want to be careful of each choice you make not to over tune it. So just because something might have a low armor class and not many hit points, doesn't necessarily mean it'll be easy to kill. Likewise, just because this thing has a low fortitude save and low hit points, it's going to have abilities and behaviors that make it more difficult to manage. 
Now here's about where we need to start deciding what exactly this animal is, because clearly it's going to be something special. Will it have resistances or weaknesses? That's going to be a little bit more dependent on what kind of animal we're making. So now before we get into skills and everything like that, let's take a step back. We have our statistics. Let's talk about exactly what we're making here. Now something interesting to look at with spiders in Pathfinder is that there's only a single spider above level 10, and it's gargantuan. Who's to say there aren't smaller spiders that are incredibly fast with venom that is designed to just eliminate their target from the inside out so that they can jump in, poison the target, jump out, wait for the poison to do its thing, and then come collect the body. I think that sounds like a really fun and terrifying idea for a high level enemy. Something that, yeah, it has low hit points, especially for its level, but it's not going to stick around. It's going to jump in, it's going to inflict its toxin, and it's going to flee the scene until the target dies. Or if it's fighting a party, maybe in, poison one person, out. Next round, back in, poison someone else, out. Just hit and run tactics until it's poisoned the entire party and they all succumb to its venom. So I'm gonna work with the workshop name of just the poison hunting spider. This is gonna change at the end. This is just sort of so we know we have our basic concept in mind. I'll also add a basic description. There we go, a lightning fast spider that rushes its prey, injects its venom and flees. It returns minutes later after its prey has succumbed to its fast acting venom. So now that we've decided we're making a kind of spider, I don't think we need to add any kind of resistance or weakness, as spiders don't inherently have anything like that. You know, they've got a body that can be pierced and stabbed. This one just happens to be incredibly fast and nimble, to the point where it will duck and weave around basic strikes. It also will not have any immunities, so we can skip over that. While on the subject of skipping over facts of a creature, I want to remind you to keep things simple. A high level creature, even a low level creature, no creature needs or should have everything. If it doesn't need a resistance, it doesn't need a weakness, don't worry about it. You're just giving the GM more work to keep track of. Now, if that resistance or weakness plays into the creature and what it does, or if it's something like an ooze, which brings with it some inherent immunities, yes, absolutely include that so that it's flesh flush with the rest of the system. But in the case of something like this, a spider is not inherently weak or resistant to anything, so keep it simple. Next up, we look at perception. If this thing has an okay wisdom score, and like we said, it is a survivalist, being a spider as well with multiple eyes, this thing is probably very perceptive. Good enough that I'm gonna give it a high perception score of 26. Sneaking up on this thing is going to be difficult. It is designed to find and attack prey, so being able to see is pretty much a must. I think giving it dark vision is an obvious choice, but here's one that I think would be really neat if it also had tremor sense. This thing is small. This thing is close to the ground. And I think its perception is high enough and it has evolved in such a way that it can track even fairly stealthy prey just by feeling the movements beneath it. And it can tell when its prey is ready to harvest by hiding nearby and waiting for its tremor sense to stop sensing the prey. The prey might be spasming or, or walking around or falling to the ground, but once those tremors stop, it knows its target is dead. Looking at the purple worm, which has a tremor sense of 100 feet, we want to give it something much smaller than that since it's also a smaller creature. So I think tremor sense up to 50 feet works perfectly. And as always, you want to fact check everything you add to your sheet. As tremor sense is an imprecise scent, unless given otherwise, you need to add it there. So I'm trying my best to mimic the wording next to the purple worm senses to once again make less work for the editors after accepting a creature, as well as just being easy to understand for a GM. So with dark vision, it can hunt at night, and then with 50 foot tremor sense, it can climb a tree or hide up to 50 feet away and wait for the tremors to stop. Next, let's look at some skill proficiencies. I know I said I was gonna follow the game mastery guide, but honestly, this tool makes it really simple. Like I know they're, they're, they're paying me and everything, but like put that aside for a second. This monster creator tool is incredibly easy to follow, and it's not the first of its kind. PF2.tools does it as well, and it's phenomenal. Either one is great. 
it just makes creating creatures so easy. Having fillable boxes and recommendations based on your roadmap, beautiful. Use this or the PF2.tools just for making monsters in the futures. It's invaluable. So this is something I actually did triple check with the book just to make sure I know. Uh, a creature can have up to three high skills and should have at least one. These are the skills it is most likely to use and it is most proud of. This thing is going to have two high skills and honestly it's pretty obvious which ones they should be. It is absolutely going to be high in acrobatics to escape from things. It's a wily creature. It's going to be all over the place and high in stealth. This will assist it in being the hit and run combatant it's designed to be and getting out before anything can happen or escaping should it be trapped by something. What we do need to keep in mind, however, is that this is an animal. This is a non-sentient low intelligence creature, so it's only gonna know how to do things that it was evolved to do, for lack of a better term. It can only perform the actions and activities that it is meant to perform. For that reason, it's not gonna have arcana, it's not gonna have occultism, it's not gonna have nature. We could potentially give it survival, and I think that's fair. I don't know when, maybe it doesn't need survival. Again, what how it survives is sort of inherent and I think that's reflected by the skill. Yeah, I think we should give it moderate survival because it is a survivalist species. It's not the biggest thing in the jungle, but it is fast and deadly enough that it knows how to survive between the legs of all these massive creatures that are stronger than it. It's not gonna have diplomacy. It's not gonna have intimidation. Honestly, I think that's fine. It would be very difficult for a situation to come up where the spider would need anything besides acrobatic stealth and survival. And that's another thing that people can take advantage of. If they require it to do something that uses one of these other skills, it's gonna be untrained. It's gonna have a very, very low bonus and it's going to fail, which it should, because it's an animal at the end of the day. It's not smart. It's not gonna set up crazy elaborate traps for the players. It is going to survive because that is what animals do. And we need to keep that in mind going forward. Animals survive. Another nice, easy thing about making an animal, we don't need to give it any items. It does not have any items because it doesn't have any hands. Spiders don't have hands, right? Like they have legs and mandibles, but I'm pretty sure they don't have hands. Now speed is going to be interesting because we want it to be fast. That's how it survives. Otherwise it would get crushed and easily chased down by larger predators. So I think this should, thing should be as fast if not faster than its larger animal brethren. So let's take a look at the purple worm and the level 11 goliath spider just to see if we can get some inspiration for a movement speed. So the purple worm has a 40 foot move speed, which for level 13 is fast, but not the fastest thing in the world. But the advantage it has is it can burrow or it can swim at half speed, both very powerful. Meanwhile, the goliath spider has a 45 foot move speed and a 35, 30 foot uh, climb speed. We want to make sure that climb speed is of course given to our hunting spider as climbing is what spiders do. You know, they stick to things and they easily climb up. As for its movement speed, I think it's faster than the Goliath spider. Sure, it's small, but I believe it to be one of the fastest animals in the jungle. Maybe not as fast as some magic or as fast as other things, but actually I wanna see, is a cheetah a creature in 5e, 2e? What am I playing? It is not. Well, let me look at first edition. Don't be afraid to look at other games as well for inspiration. You know, a lot of things translate to other systems fairly easily. That's why conversions exist and are not impossible to do. So take it with a grain of salt when looking at an outside um, system and always prioritize the system you're designing for, but don't be afraid to take inspiration from anything. So a cheetah in first edition had a 50 foot move speed. I think 50 foot sounds good. This level 13 spider is as fast as a cheetah. I think that's terrifying and I love it. And then just make sure we word things properly. So we put 50 feet comma 30 feet climb. I think that's correct. It's not. You see, this is why you fact check, you double check, you quadruple check everything to make sure the wording is precise. Like at the end of the day, that's like docking one point on a test, but that could be the point that pushes you under the winning margin. You never know and you want it to be as accurate as possible. It also just looks nicer, you know, when your stat block looks the same as an official one, it just makes it that much easier for yours to be taken seriously. And that sounds kind of rude, but it's true. You know, if you want to be taken seriously, you need to appear as though you are taking your product seriously. That's just true to life. All right, now we need to decide on really a 
big thing. This is going to be the spider's big thing. It's attacks. Now, it's of course going to have some special abilities, probably a unique poison. But beyond that, it's just an animal. This is something that needs to be said. Just, I'm sorry I say it so many times, but keep it simple. You know, we could give this thing 50 abilities, the ability to shoot web, to super repel, to do a bunch of fancy stuff, but be careful. If you give your creature too many abilities, it's not going to be possible to follow. I'll talk about that more when we get to the actual abilities. For now, let's decide its attacks. This thing is only planning to attack one time per round. As I said, it's designed to get in, bite the prey, and get out. So its attack bonus should be good enough that it won't miss but it should also not be abusable. You need to be very careful in design. Just because you design something one way doesn't mean people can't twist it to find something to abuse. That's sort of the curse of TTRPGs in general. When in doubt, I just do the math. Like sure, we could follow the roadmap here and give it a 27 to hit to be really accurate because it kind of should be, but what we could do instead is say, okay, it is what, level 13, so if it's proficient in its weapon, which it's going to be, it's going to be 13 plus eight from dexterity, that's 21. Now do I decide, is it master or legendary with its attack? With a 21, if it's a master, plus 27. If it's legendary, it's plus 29. I think because this is what it does, the spider bites things. It doesn't really do much else. I think it's legendary. I think this thing is a almost legendary creature that would be talked about and avoided at all costs, and it will deal, it'll have a plus uh, 29 to hit. It's, it's terrifying. If this thing attacks a group of low-level players, like if they're level 10 or 11, they're getting crit probably, but I think that's okay, especially if we put more thought into the flavor of the design. I think this is a solo hunting spider. I don't think they travel in groups. I think once they're born and hatched, they leave and isolate themselves. So I don't think you'll ever fight more than one of these at a time. And especially if we make a point like that in our flavor, design, and explanation, you can sort of get away with a little bit of this. Now, like I said, of course, a GM can just be rude and put 10 of these in one place and murder their party, but that's kind of their problem. So we are going to hit a new attack. It is going to be melee. It is going to be fangs with an attack, as we looked at, of plus 29. Now the damage and traits do get a little bit important as well. I don't think this thing does much damage up front. It recommends 3d12 plus 21. I don't think it needs to do that much up front. Let's look at something else to get, again, a, a reference. The purple worm deals massive damage up front. That's sort of what it does. So its jaws being 3d10 plus 15, that's a lot of damage and it grabs you, but that's it. That's where that attack ends, unless of course it starts to constrict or swallow whole, but that's a whole different story. If we are planning to inflict a poison and probably a fast acting lethal one at that, we need to pull back on the upfront damage and really rely on that. Let's take a look at the Goliath spider. It does have its own venom. Now it does deal the same damage, 2d12 plus 12, 2d12 plus 15, so it's, um. The flat damage is slightly higher, so we can probably still get away with the same number of damage dice, we just want to lower the base damage. Although also this is just two levels lower. Now the Goliath Spider, worth noting, this poison is not meant to kill you. The Goliath Spider is meant to do most of its own damage, this does 2d6 around. That's it. So, I think we can take that and sort of flip it on its head, so let's look back at our spider. First off, we look at traits. I don't think the fangs need any traits. We could give it agile, but I don't think that adds anything to the creature. Like I said, it's not meant to be attacking multiple times, so even if it does end up attacking multiple times, it's probably gonna be more of a flailing attack. It's not gonna be used to trying to combo attack with itself, so I think the full multiple attack penalty is fine. As for its damage, I'm gonna do the same as the hunting spider, as the goliath spider. I'm gonna do 2d12, uh, Plus, plus 13 sounds about right. A little bit more than the Goliath Spider, a little bit less than the Purple Worm, but we're also going to add plus, uh, it's still a working name, uh, we'll just put plus Venom for now, and we'll fix that later on. Oh, forgot to add the damage type. It is going to be piercing, because fangs pierce things. Now again, we have the question. I looked at the Goliath Spider. It has a ranged web attack. I honestly don't think we need to give the Hunting Spider a ranged attack. I don't think it's a ranged combatant. I think it is incredibly fast and is designed to get in, attack, and get out. And where we'll make up for the lack of ranged attack, we'll be giving it a special ability or two that makes it just as competent. 
So for now, we'll move on. It doesn't have spells. It has a minus four intelligence. This thing is not casting magic. It is an animal. Moving on. And just like that, we're at special abilities. Once we finish this, we're done. We go back, we clean it up, we give it a name, we give it a description, and our creature is done. And suddenly all you spellcasters have a new option for summon animal. So there's an ability I definitely want to give it. Again, names always come last for me because I want to make sure they fit perfectly. Uh, so for the first ability, we're just going to call it Ambush. We're going to give it more. This is just a working title for me. Uh, and it's going to be th a three action movement. And it doesn't actually need any traits. This is going to be its, its big move. If all things go well, every single round, it is going to use this combined effect, which means we need to make it very powerful. A three action activity is its whole turn. It can do nothing else. It can't prepare to do anything else. That is it. And I think it would be interesting for this thing to be able to move a ton and make one attack. This is really its in and out ability. So what's a really fun thing to play with? Action economy. What's a really fun action to give more of that's still kind of balanced? Movement. Now this may be really powerful, but I think what would make the poison hunting spider a very threatening creature. So I still need to clean the wording up a bit, but I got the basic gist of it down. For three actions, the poison hunting spider strides three times. It makes a fang strike at any point during this movement. If the poison hunting spider ends this movement behind cover, it can take the hide action. So this is exactly what we're trying to make here, where it zooms out, it bites you on the drive-by, jumps back into the tree line and hides. So this thing comes out of nowhere from behind a tree, injects its venom, and disappears back into the forest out of sight. What I do next, typically when I'm designing a creature, is I try to find something with the most similar ability out there. For example, for the first line there, I took it almost directly from Path of Iron, which is it makes a fang strike at any point during this movement. However, to be a little bit more accurate, I'm going to try to find a creature that can attack during movement and also a creature that can hide at the end of a movement action to make sure I'm getting the most accurate terminology possible. Honestly, at this point, it's a little easier just to grab the physical book because trying to find a creature like that online takes way longer. Okay, so I just spent so long looking that my phone ran out of space on its hard drive to save the video file. So I had to stop recording, upload the video file to my computer, and then start recording again. Uh, in the meantime, I couldn't really find much that fits this description. I could have sworn there were creatures or at least a rogue feat that let you stride and then hide, but I could not find one. I think this wording is okay. This is the kind of thing where hopefully they won't hold it against me, but I can't find a better wording for it. So yeah, it's the poison hunting spider. Uh, one thing I did catch, and you need to make sure you catch too, stride, strike, any specific action that is a named action needs to be capitalized. Now this does get weird. Things like the term reaction is not capitalized. Things like action and such, they are not but only specific things are capitalized. Stride, strike, I believe hide is capitalized as well because it is the name of an action. So be very careful, cross-reference your terminology. But the poison hunting spider strides three times. It can make a fang strike at any point during this movement. If the poison hunting spider ends this movement behind cover, it can take the hide action. So this thing basically gets to move 150 feet, strike, and hide again for three actions. This is very powerful, yes, but we need to remember that this is level 13. The players are going to have level 13, maybe 11 or 12 characters who can retaliate to this. You know, they might have reactions, they might have that one barbarian feat that lets you move with them kind of deal. There's a lot that can go wrong here, but on its own, it's very powerful, and in a typical situation, this thing would be very powerful, very difficult to defeat. And thinking about that, thinking about a creature this strong, it should not be super common. I actually believe this thing deserves the uncommon trait, not for any like mechanical reason, but because if this was a widely 
uh, a widely common species, animals wouldn't exist. They would eat all the animals. So I think in a jungle or a forest, wherever this thing is found, you might be unlikely to find more than two or three in an entire forest. Like, and I think part of it's they don't reproduce on purpose. I think they're a very slowly repopulating animal. I think they're uncommon and for good reason. You don't want your level five players coming across this thing in the backyard. So after Ambush, I think we can maybe give it one more special ability and then the Venom and then we're done. We need to finish up naming, clean up some text, and we're good. Let's do the Venom next. I think that's important. That's sort of the cornerstone of this entire thing. Because right now, it doesn't do a lot of damage. It's just really fast. So we need to give this guy, well, again, we're just calling it Venom for now. Uh, it is not an action. I believe it is still offensive. Let me check. Yes, it is still deemed an offense category uh, with the poison trait, of course. Now, depending on what we do with this, we might need to add more traits afterwards, but I honestly think this might just be sheer raw damage. Because this thing is meant to, it doesn't, it doesn't put you to sleep, it doesn't paralyze you, it doesn't make you clumsy, it just burns you from the inside with poison damage. Maybe it even deals acid damage? What if it did both? Now we're getting interesting. What if this thing's venom is acidic? and its body is resistant to its own acid. Or it could just have glands that produce it that don't disperse to the rest of its body, so just the fangs are acid resistance. This gives us a couple different directions to go. We could give it an acid resistance, which would be kind of neat, give it a little bit of different, like something a little different, but I don't think it's necessary. I don't think its body is resistant to acid. In the same way that something can be poisoned by its own venom, I don't think it needs to resist the acid in it, but I love the idea of this venom. I, uh, I forgot to delete the video file off my phone. I just moved it over, so uh, my recording crashed again. But I also like that it deals acid damage. <laughs> so once again, let's look at an existing poison effect that's of a similar level and try to replicate it, but again, giving it more damage and different damage types. The Goliath Spider, as we said, doesn't deal a whole lot of damage. At level 11, 2d6 damage per round isn't bad. It's the slowed that's gonna get you. So let's look at really ramping up that damage. So first off, we're gonna need to word it correctly. So I think what I'm actually gonna do is cheat here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and just copy this down and then paste it in and edit from there. You can see another great thing that this tool does. It didn't copy paste the bold, but because the word saving throw is in there, saving throw is auto bolded when added in. So we're gonna want a pretty high fortitude save against this thing. If a DC 30 was for level 11, we could probably do DC 32. This is where I'll actually break the GMG out again. When looking for something like this, I often just look at the spell DC and spell attack bonus. If a DC would fit for a spell of that level, it would fit for an ability of that level as well. So if we look at level 13, a 33 would be a high DC. If we wanted to make this thing incredibly deadly, we could give it a 37 DC. Make sure that this thing, if it hits you, the poison is going off. I think 37 is a bit too high, but 33 might be just a touch too low. What's interesting at these high levels, especially with fortitude saves, is that a lot of classes automatically crit succeed their normal successes. So after a certain level, Poisons become a lot less scary. I think a 35 DC fits very well here. It's difficult, it's tough. What, if someone is expert in fortitude and has to roll against this, what's that look like? If the player is level 12, 12 plus expert would be plus four, would be plus 16. And then if they have like a plus three constitution, they're getting plus 19, that's tough. That is a, D says if they have to roll a 16, to pass, that is a lot. But again, passes are a lot stronger at higher levels. And again, expert, this would wreck a spellcaster. This is definitely an anti-back line. It's gonna sprint out of the bushes, it's gonna bite your wizard, and it's gonna drop him. I think I'm gonna make it 34. A little bit higher than high, but not terrible. You know, that is a low 
expert fortitude. The Barbarian gets bit by this, he probably has more than a 50% chance to resist the Venom, which turns into a crit success. So it's interesting, you can't balance every creature around every class. That is impossible, and that's why counters exist. This thing is made to be taken out, or at least distracted by the Barbarian, while the spellcasters target its low fortitude and will saves. So now let's talk about what it does. How long does it last? A lot of poisons do last six rounds. This is long enough to really hurt, but not last forever. This is a poison that's designed basically just for a fight, and I think that's exactly what this is. This is designed to kill a target in about a minute, so six rounds actually sounds perfect to me. At stage one, it's not going to inflict any conditions. We can get rid of that, but I think it's going to deal 3d6 poison and 3d6 acid damage. Is that a lot? Yeah, that's a potential 36 damage. Uh, but that doesn't give us, you know what, let's, let's dial it back, let's dial it back, let's dial it back to 2d6 of each at stage one. It's important to, you know, write out what you're thinking and then take a step back and look at it overall. You know, 3d6 plus 3d6, that's not bad at level 13, but remember this is just stage one. So let's move on. I think that's perfect. It'll last for one round before proceeding or resolving, and then we're gonna upgrade it to 3d6. So 2d6 acid damage, or 3d6 acid damage plus 3d6 poison damage for a round. Stage three is where it'll probably kick into high gear. A lot of poisons at stage three or higher get a lot worse because if you're not cured by that point, especially with how many types of cures and potions and spells exist, they need to be punishing. Now, what you don't want to do is resign a character to complete and absolute death. That is not a fun game mechanic. You know, if your wizard gets bit and you don't happen to have any antidotes, you don't happen to have a cleric that can cast remove poison or anything like that, and they crit fail their saving throw, you never want to lose a character to two crappy dice rolls. So be careful. I think it, it seems boring, but it works. Where we just ramp it up by another D6 right at stage three. Now we have a question to make. Do we add a stage four, which is even worse, or expect that once they're at stage three, they're just going to keep burning for an average 24 damage around? And that's on median rolls of both. It can be upwards of 48 damage around off of 4d6. That's brutal. Trying to think, a level 13 character, they might have like 200 health if they're a barbarian, but if they're like a wizard, they're probably gonna only have like 100, 120-ish. So this could easily burn a wizard down in three turns. And you think, if this spider is preying on things in the forest that are, you know, easily half its level, I guess, thinking mechanically, its prey is not going to have more than 100 hit points. I think this works perfectly. I think it burns you for a ton of damage, but then it doesn't get worse. It just keeps burning you away from the inside with the poison, with the acid. And if you don't cure it and you keep failing your saves, you're going to be taking 8d6 poison damage every single round. Although, comparing it to purple worm venom, that's not bad. Purple Worm Venom is doing about the same. Purple Worm Venom is actually the same, but it also adds Enfeebled. So now we have a choice to make. Do we... Well, ours also has a higher Fortitude save. The Worm's was DC 32, ours is DC 34. And it is the same level. So I think I like that. We're removing the conditions from each stage, but we are diversifying the damage and increasing the DC to resist it. I like it. This thing is not trying to do something fancy to a target. It is trying to inject its venom, melt the insides, and then come back a minute later and drink it. I like it. I think that's good. I don't think it needs to do more damage than the purple worm venom. I think that if this thing bites you and you don't get immediate care and you fail your fortitude saves, you're dead. And I think that's how it should be. You know, if you get caught alone, what I like about this, even if you're like a cleric or something, it doesn't knock you unconscious. It doesn't paralyze you. It doesn't put you to sleep. You can save yourself. You can use a medicine check on yourself to get a bonus to your saving throw and stuff. This is not instant death, but boy is it fast death if you can't fix it.
This makes for a very interesting one-off encounter in the middle of the forest. This is something I would use to make travel less boring. You know, they're traveling through a forest from point A to point B and they're level 12. Sure, I'll throw one of these at them. A combat does not always need to risk the life of every character in the party. A combat can be just as scary if it only threatens one person's life. This jumps out of the woods, this bites the wizard, that runs away, the barbarian runs off to find it, and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh god, Ezrin's dying, holy cow, cleric, remove poison now! And that's a moment, that is a roleplay moment, that is a combat moment, I don't think it needs more than this. This creature is not designed for long form combat. It might not even get it to a full combat on its own, you know? Because on its own, what is it gonna do? It's gonna ambush, and it's gonna ambush. I think, this is why I talk my, my monsters through, I talk through scenarios. I think in order to use ambush, it should already have to be hidden. That way, if you have your eyes on it, it can't do this crazy powerful stride, stride, bite, stride, hide. But if you have your eyes on it, all it can do is move and hide and bite you. That's it. It's just a spider. It just happens to be an incredibly deadly spider. Is there a spider trait? Good. Like most animals, I'm going to leave it as neutral. Yeah, so let's, let's add that to ambush. Well, now I need to look up how this... Uh, I haven't had the monster tool up this entire time. You're welcome. So I need to find the correct terminology for an ability that can only be used while hidden. Time to go off on a lovely search again. Okay, so I found a rogue feat. This is the most similar thing I could find right now. Uh, Spring from the Shadows actually doesn't say you are required to be hidden technically anywhere on it. It's heavily implied, but I do like that it says you must end your movement next to an enemy you're hidden from or undetected by. So I think we can steal the wording here and add it to our spider. Okay. I think I'm happy with this. I would normally get this double or triple checked by people, and I probably will. You'll, pro you'll be seeing like 99% of the finished product here at this video, but sprinting from seemingly nowhere, the poison hunting spider strides three times. It can make a fang strike at any point during this movement against a creature that is that it is hidden or undetected by. The poison hunting spider remains hidden from or undetected by that creature until after it strikes. If the poison hunting spider ends this movement behind cover, it can take the hide action. I think that's good. You know, this kind of adds to the thing where it is only still hidden from the creature it strikes. So everyone else can see it coming. If it sprints by the fighter to bite the wizard, the wizard doesn't know it's there, but the fighter can still take an attack of opportunity. This leaves openings and the only person who doesn't see it coming is the spider's target, and the target will probably have their back turned is how the spider would likely go for it. I like this, it makes sense, I like the venom, I just need to add some... names. Though I will say, one thing I would always consider doing, and I'm about to do it right now, is checking through the creature abilities either in your books or right on archives of Nethys. These are really easy plug and play abilities you can tack on your creature to give it some extra spice without adding too much more complication for the GM. Things like grab and swallow whole, once you've played a bit, are pretty easy to know what they do right on site. So take a look through here like I'm gonna do and pick one you like. I did think about giving it sneak attack, but I think that's unnecessary. This thing deals damage with its poison, not by striking at specific vital arteries. Yeah, honestly, I think Tremor Sense is good enough. I think I'm happy with our little boy here. Like I said, I'm gonna go give it some names. I'm gonna clean up anything I need to, but overall, I think this is a very interesting single one-off encounter monster that can make travel a little bit less boring. Okay, I think we're done. The things I've added here is I've renamed it the Cheetah Spider to make note of its incredibly fast speeds and ability to move incredibly quickly. I've changed it, of course, to Cheetah Spider Venom because that makes sense. And that's sort of the 
way it's worded is if it is an animal's venom, the venom is typically just named after the animal, of course. Uh, the final thing I changed here is ambush was changed to swift injection, because I think that sounds really cool. And the final thing I added was a light description, which is sort of the flavor text you'd see next to the creature in a book. <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed, but I've already changed a few words and I haven't even recorded my full read through yet. Every time I read through, I find something I want to change. Read your entries out loud. Bonus tip. Named not only for its speed, but also for how fast its venom can kill prey. The cheetah spider's venom is one of the most lethal and fast acting of any known spider. Thanks to its size and coloration, it finds any forest both a safe home and hunting ground. It hunts its prey through simple ambushes, however it lets its venom do the work for it. Just as quickly as it appears, it bites its victim and vanishes back into the woods surrounding it. There it waits for the venom to take its course. The cheetah spider will lie in hiding, listening to the footsteps and inevitable body hitting the ground. Then, once the coast is clear, it will creep back out to its now dead prey, consuming its already liquefied insides. It should go without saying, but should one be lucky enough to see a cheetah spider before it has struck, they should promptly back away slowly and find a different route. And there it is! There's a monster! That took about an hour and a half, give or take, from some uh, technical difficulties, but this is a simple creature. You know, it moves in, it inflicts venom, it disappears, it does a bunch of poison acid damage. I love it. I would love to run this creature. You may run it for free, but you may not enter it into the RPG Superstar Contest because I'm gonna do that as soon as I finish recording this video. So that is it for me. This video, it was sponsored by Roll for Combat, but it's also something I wanted to do. So thank you RFC for making this tool so easily accessible. Thank you for running such a cool contest. And hey, if you wanna enter the contest, get to work. There's only like a week left to enter. Use the link in the description or go to rpgsuperstar.com. Com. So thank you so much for watching. Feel free to use the Cheetah Spider if you want. Shout out to my patrons for keeping the lights on. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And if you ever see a Cheetah Spider, run.